Well, this morning we come to our final instalment on our series, Divine Direction, Learning and Living God's Will. I want to quickly give you a brief summary of what we've looked at so far uh, before we come into our final study this morning and consider really a, a summary of everything that we're going to look at. But let's quickly look back and provide an overview of what we've considered in the last five studies. In order for us to understand what the divine direction for our life is, to understand uh, God's will for our life, we first of all spoke about the fact that God has a sovereign will. God's sovereign will is entire. Uh, it includes everything in this universe. It is enduring. It will never change. It cannot stop. And this sovereign will of God was determined from the beginning. So it's also eternal. This great sovereign will has determined all things and nothing in the universe will get in the way of God's will, God's plan for the ages. And that includes everything in our lives. But God not only has a sovereign will, he also has what we call a stated will. And that's what he reveals to us in his word. That's what he desires for us to do. God's stated will is simply obedience to him. Uh, we then took the opportunity to talk about the fact that we have the privilege of being able to make choices. Choices is a, a great privilege that God grants us, but every choice that we make has consequences for good and for bad. Uh, we learned about the sovereignty of God and how that balances with our responsibility as people. We also talked about the idea of discerning God's will when it comes to our calling and careers. Uh, God calls for us to be productive, and that productivity will be different for different people in different stages and places, but we learned about the principles of discerning God's will in that. And last week, we had a discussion relating to the times we make bad choices, bad, sinful decisions, but how we can recover from that and be sure that we are still in God's will. As Christians, we'll often carry the wounds of bad choices, but we also have the wonderful grace of God that assures us that we can rest in his sovereignty and go forward with great confidence. Well, what I want to do this morning is provide you with a study that is titled Walking in the Will of God. And what this is really designed to do is provide us with a final word of encouragement to know that when we talk about God's will, this is not an academic exercise. It's not something we just file away in our brains and say, well, you know, I've got all this great information about God's will. God's will and our life is something that we daily participate in. And we need to be excited about it as God's people. We need to be committed to the task of actually walking in God's will. Now, what I want to paint for you is a picture. The picture is one of a journey. If you are preparing yourself to go to a particular destination, perhaps it's a holiday or perhaps it's um, for serious business, there is a few things that you need in order to be effective in a journey. First of all, you need provisions. Uh, you need the ability to get to the place where you're going. Uh, secondly, you need directions. You need a pathway. You need a road. You need a, a form of of understanding where you're actually going. And finally, you need to have in mind the purpose of the journey. You need to know why you're actually going there. There are things to achieve and to accomplish. And that's how we are to view our entire life. And these are the three points that we're going to look at this morning. And what I want us to think about is this, that your life as a Christian is a life that is a part of an epic journey. And the great journey you're on has provisions given to you by God. You have a pathway to walk down and there is an ultimate purpose that this journey leads to. And at the center of all of this is a life lived for the will of God. And we will do well to remind ourselves of this constantly if we're going to be effective in being, in being individuals that are living according to God's will. So I want to begin by reading a passage for you 
It's only two verses and it's from the book of Hebrews. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 20 to 21. And this is the great benediction, uh, the great word of blessing upon God's people that ends this great letter by the writer to the Hebrews. And it's from these two verses that we're going to look at our three stages of the journey as we walk in the will of God. So consider with me uh, Hebrews 13 verses 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, from this passage, I want to ask the question, how can we walk in the will of God? Well, the first thing I want you to notice in verse 20 is if you're going to walk in the will of God, you need to know about the provisions that God has given all of his people. God wants you to walk in his will. God wants you to be on this journey. He wants you to participate in this. But God doesn't simply save you and then say, now just walk in my will and I'll meet you in heaven when you get there. God is loving. He is caring. He provides for his children. He is concerned for you. He wants you to make it to the final destination. So God in his great love and care for us all has given all of us provisions. Now, if we're going to go on a hike, you need to load your backpack with provisions. You're going to need a drink bottle. You're going to need to have some protein. Perhaps you're going to need a first aid kit and a few other things that you're going to need to help you on this journey. So it is with a life that is walking in the will of God. You cannot walk in the will of God if you do not have with you the provisions that are necessary. But the good news for us is that God has given the provisions to us. We don't have to earn them. We don't have to create them. We don't have to buy them. God has given to us provisions. Provisions so that we can effectively walk in his will. Now, what are these provisions? Let me just quickly mention the three of them to you in verse 20, and then we'll unpack them one at a time. The first provision God has given you is peace. The second is pastoral care. And the third one is promises. Peace, pastoral care, and promises. Have a look at the first provision there in verse 20. It begins by saying, Now may the God of peace. If you are a child of God, you belong to the God of peace. God has granted you peace. Now, in order for us to really appreciate that, in order for us to maybe move past our Christian cliches, we can just simply walk along and say, we have a God of peace. Yes, peace be unto you. And it doesn't really go very deep when we just share it with words. But in order for us to understand how significant this provision is, why you need this in the backpack of life as you walk in God's will, in order for us to really appreciate the depth of God's peace, I think we need to compare it with the world's peace. Now, we live in a world that promises us peace. But the problem with the peace in this world is it's not real. Let me just give you a few examples of why the earth's peace, the world's peace, really isn't a great provision. There is a thing called shallow peace in this world. Now, I remember when I was a school teacher, I saw this one all the time. I was in the schoolyard. That was one of my favorite tasks, actually, being a teacher, because I got so many um, interesting life lessons just observing uh, children in the schoolyard and, and doing all sorts of activities with them. But one of the things you would notice quite often is children would get into arguments. They would get into fights. And then you would sort of walk over, and another teacher had sort of broken it up, and they would say to the two kids, now, shake hands and say, I'm sorry. 
Now, you look at the kids' faces. They are fuming. They are just so angry. On the inside, they're thinking, you know, I'm going to beat you up after school or I'm going to manipulate the system and I'm going to really get to you later on. But notice what they do. They shake hands. I'm sorry. Now, peace took place. But wouldn't you agree that that was a shallow peace? It didn't go any deeper than the words. Now, we can be a little bit more sophisticated in that, in how we uh, perhaps can do the same thing. Uh, we see it in adult relationships as well. But the world says there is a peace, but it's shallow. It doesn't go deep. Just saying sorry on the outside, we know that no one means it. So there is a, a shallow type of peace. Uh, but then there is also what we could call a, a selfish peace. And that is, we can go around saying that we're peacemakers, but it's easy to be peaceful with those that we get along with. Uh, we can find a group of people who are very similar to us, who have same likes, uh, perhaps the same dislikes, and we get along with them pretty well. And then we say, see, I'm, I'm at peace with them. But we deliberately don't want to associate with people who are very different to us because in doing so, um, we're, having, we're going to have to give up some things or perhaps deal with some issues. So we can end up having this very selfish kind of peace. There is also another peace called a short-lived peace. And this is something we see politically in our world. Uh, often now, politicians will be doing what they can to make sure that there is peace, peace with other nations, peace with, with other um, groups of individuals. And we will see all these great uh, media events in which there will be summits called and world leaders will come together and they'll shake hands and, and they'll sign papers and make all these promises and treaties and say, see, there is peace. But at the end, we know it's short-lived because a lot of the time these guys just go back to their home and do their own plans anyway. But this is all optics. It's something that's really short-lived. Sometimes perhaps solutions are created, but they don't last. We know that from the history of the world because we have wars and, and they constantly occur. So there is a, a type of peace that's in this world, but it's shallow, it's selfish, and it's short-lived. But Jesus provides a peace to his people that isn't shallow, that isn't selfish, and isn't short-lived. He provides a deep and lasting peace. Jesus said to his disciples on many occasions, peace be unto you. We are told in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, that he is the Prince of Peace. What do we mean when we say that God has provided us with peace? When we are told that God is the God of peace, what this means is that there is no hostility between us and God anymore. Why was there hostility? Because we were sinners. We were once his enemies. We deserved his eternal judgment. But Jesus Christ died in our place. We have trusted Christ. And as a result of this, there is now peace between us and God. His judgment is no longer hanging over our heads. God has provided this for you. That is in the backpack of your life. God has provided you with peace. No matter how troubling things are in this world, you can know and confidently say that yes, times are rough, times are tough, but I have peace with the creator of the universe. He is not angry with me. His judgment has been absorbed by his son. I have peace with God. That is a beautiful and precious thing. Do you know and understand? Do you take hold of this great provision? If you're going to walk in the will of God, use the provision of peace because that is going to liberate you with so many things. It's going to remind you what really matters in this life and what doesn't. You, as a child of God, have peace with God. But you not only have been granted the provision of peace, but notice the text goes on to say, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. God has not only granted you peace, but he has granted you a great shepherd. What do shepherds do? They care for their sheep. This is what we call the provision of pastoral care. You have the provision of the greatest pastor in the world, and that is Jesus. He is here called the great shepherd. In John chapter 10, he's called the good shepherd. In 1 Peter 5, he is called the chief shepherd. 
This shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he's called a shepherd means that he is going to provide for you. He is going to protect you. He is going to guide you. To really appreciate the importance of this, just consider the, the wonderful words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The writer to the Hebrews says that you have been given the great provision of pastoral care. Jesus Christ will see to it that he provides for all of your needs, spiritually and physically. Not only that, he will see to it that when you go through the dark valleys of life, he won't snatch you from those valleys. He will allow you to go through these difficult times. Hardship will be on your path as you walk. But what the writer to the Hebrews says, you need to know, though, that you have the great shepherd. He will care for you. He will always be with you. When you are in those darkest of moments, those crushing times, times of despair, times of distress, times of anxiety, times when we are concerned about loved ones who don't know Jesus, times when we're committed to living out the gospel and people treat us badly, perhaps we lose friends, perhaps people disappoint us, when we're experiencing all sorts of pressures, perhaps we're even worried about the affairs of this world. The writer says that you've been provided with a great shepherd and that great shepherd will pastorally care for you. This means you can go to the shepherd at any time, you can pray to him, he will love you, he will care for you, and he will see to it that you will make it to your final destination. So if we're going to walk in the will of God, know your provisions. You've been provided with peace. You've been provided with pastoral care. Finally, you've been provided with a great promise. We read at the end of verse 20, by the blood of the eternal covenant. This eternal covenant is talking about the great promise that God has made to you. This is a promise that he made through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31. And this is called the new covenant. And the new covenant is that God has promised all those that are his people that he will give you in the gift of salvation a new heart, that you will be forgiven of all your sins and you will be able to enter into a special covenant relationship with God. And in this covenant relationship, you will have a new disposition to life. You will desire Him. You will desire to walk in His ways. You will even be granted the Holy Spirit who will be within you. God has promised you this great covenant, and this covenant came at a cost, and the cost was by the blood of Jesus. Jesus died so that you would receive these great provisions. So if we're going to walk in the will of God, if we are going to take seriously all the things that we've looked at in our previous weeks, if we are struggling to make decisions concerning our work, concerning relationships, concerning just daily decisions, we need to know that God has granted every single one of us provisions and we will do well to make use of them. God wants you to use these provisions. These are the only provisions that will help you walk through this world and be in the will of God. Know God's peace, know God's pastoral care, know God's promises. We now come to the second point, and this here is found in verse 21. And what we have here is we move from the provisions to the pathway. The pathway. If we're going to walk in the will of God, we actually need to go down the right pathway. And that pathway is going to involve effort. It's going to involve commitment. Have a look at what we read in the first part of verse 21. We read that now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. The pathway that you and I are called to go down is a pathway of obedience. 
That is what our call in life is as God's people. We are to live a life that is pleasing to God. Whatever we do, whoever we're with, wherever we are, that is God's will for our lives, to live a life pleasing with him. My favorite picture of a life walking down a pathway pleasing to God is a character in Genesis 5. He's mentioned in Hebrews 11, and he's also briefly mentioned in the epistle to Jude. And this man was a man by the name of Enoch. We are told in Genesis 5, in a very interesting chapter, of a series of individuals that they lived a certain amount of years, had a certain amount of children, and then it says repeatedly in Genesis 5, and he died, and he died. And when you read through Genesis 5, you just sort of anticipate after you read the information, this is the man's name, this is how old he was when he had kids, and then this is how old he was, and he died. And you just kind of keep doing it. But then there is this huge interruption in the middle of Genesis 5. You come to Enoch and it says that Enoch lived this long, um, he had these children, and then just as you go to say, and he died, the text says, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for the Lord took him. He just interrupts the whole chapter. He didn't die. And you go over to Hebrews 6 and it says, instead of that Enoch walked with God, it says Enoch pleased God. Walking with God is to please God. Enoch lived a life for an audience of one. His life was a life in which everything he did was done with the view of wanting to please his creator. He lived a life worthy of his calling. Now notice again verse 21. We learn in this verse that two things take place if we're going to go down this pathway. God must do a work in us and we must respond to that work with an effort. In other words, we cannot walk in the will of God if it's not for God working in us. But we then can't sit back and say, well, I'm going to live the will of God because God's working in me. God actually wants us to be committed to that task and respond to his grace. Notice the word in verse 21, equip you. That's what God is going to do. He is going to equip you on this pathway. And the word here for equip is a very interesting word. Uh, The word here equip means to, to mend, to restore, so that you will be useful. Interestingly enough, this same word is used in Matthew 4 when we read about James and John in their fishing boat. Um, How is it translated in Matthew 4? It's translated as mending. What were they mending? Uh, They were mending their nets. Uh, The idea of mending their nets was that they're all tangled. Perhaps there's some um, tears and, and they're piecing it all together so that these nets will be effective when they cast them back out into the water again. And what we learn here is that that's what God is doing in our lives. He is mending us. He is restoring us so that we will be useful. He is doing an active work in the lives of all of his people. Interestingly enough, this word is also used in Galatians 6 and verse 1. And there the apostle Paul calls for people, for believers, to reach out to those that have gone wayward in the faith and he talks about restoring them that's the same word it's to restore them so that they can be brought back to the place where they can be effective well God is doing a work in us on this pathway in which he is equipping us with everything good that we may do his will God is providing you with everything you need to do his will on this pathway God is doing this invisible work in your life. He has given you the Holy Spirit. He has given you his word. He has given you other Christians to encourage and to motivate you. As you go along this pathway, I can't help but think of the great images of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. As we learn about the, as a Christian on the pathway to the celestial city, he has various encounters. He meets some people on the pathway who wander into the world. He has other people on the pathway who encourage him and support him to keep on going. He meets enemies on the pathway. 
And we need to know that God provides us with much good on that pathway and that good is his people, that good is his word, that good is his promises. And as we make use of these things, we continue to do what it says in verse 21, that God is working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. God is equipping us that we would do his will and in the end do what is pleasing in his sight. God is working in us so that we respond and actually do his will. So we need to be clear in our minds that if we're going to walk in the will of God, we have a pathway to go down and that pathway is what God wants us to do. If that is our instinctive thinking when it comes to all life's choices, that the very first thing we think is, what would God have me do in this situation? What would be pleasing to him? What would bring him the most honor and glory in this? All of a sudden we realize that life is not about us. It is about him. And that's what brings me to the final point. If we're going to walk in the will of God, we not only need provisions, we not only need to go down the pathway, which is obedience, but finally, we need to know what the purpose is. What is the purpose of your life? That's a good question. Instinctively, all people would answer that question with different ways, but really coming down to the same concept, and that is to do what I want. Because at the end of the day, the most important person in the world is you. Uh, that's what we think. But isn't it interesting that this text ends by saying that all of this is done through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. The purpose of your life as a Christian is the glory of God. That is why you exist. You and me and every human being in this world exists for the glory of God. And when God saves you, he provides for you, he places you on a pathway with the purpose of bringing him glory. Now, you can't add to God's glory because God in and of himself is all glorious. But what we can do is ascribe to him glory. We can affirm and recognize and acknowledge that glory. If you were to go over to the book of Revelation, chapter 5, you have this incredible scene where there is a crowd of people from every tribe, every language, every nation. And these individuals are surrounding God's throne. And these individuals have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. They've been forgiven of their sins. This is believers, believers of all ages. And they're assembled before God's throne. And what they are declaring is, worthy are you to receive glory, honor, and praise. They are glorifying God. They are recognizing that God is all in all. He is majestic. He is mighty. He deserves all attention and focus. The goal of all things in this universe is the glory of God. That's what's going to make heaven so great. The glory of God will be seen most perfectly and in the most complete way. Everything we do will be truly done to the glory of God because we won't have any sin in our lives. Our life will no longer be in a struggle in which we are battling with our will and God's will. Everything will be truly done for him, which means everything will be truly productive. The activities that we do in heaven, the, the participation in, in cities, in, in fellowship, in enjoying gardens, and all the great goodness that God will allow us to participate in in the new heaven and new earth will be most beautiful because we will all do it for the glory of God. His glory will just be everywhere. It will cover every part of the new heaven and new earth. And the writer to the Hebrews says that this is your goal. This is what you've been made for. Your chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is an exciting statement. If we're going to walk in the will of God, you need to just get it simple. Sim make it very simple in your mind. Your life has a purpose and your purpose is to glorify God. Let me just say something that is just so contrary to our human nature. The most important individual in this world is not you. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is the most important one. That is what life is all about. It is about him. It is about promoting the excellencies of his name. So let me just bring this to a close by saying that if we are going to walk in the will of God, we need to be committed to be a part of this journey. Walking in the will of God is not going to be easy. It's going to involve effort. But like any journey, we need to know where we're going. And where we're going is to bring glory to Christ in all of our decisions. But if we're going to do that, we need provisions. We need to be enabled. We need to be equipped. We need supplies. And our Lord has provided them for us in his peace, in his pastoral care, and in his promises. And then we need to actually go down the pathway. And that pathway is going to be hard. There's going to be potholes. There's going to be people who are going to pull us off. There's going to be Vanity Fair over there. It's going to be so attractive and we're going to have to go down Bypath Meadow and, and enjoy the pleasures of this world. We've got all these temptations, but we have a pathway. And this pathway at times will be very narrow, but it's a pathway that is well-worn. It has footsteps of many who have gone before us, many people who have made it to the final destination. And they're cheering us on saying, keep going. It's worth it. Because when you finally make it here, you will see all the glory. It's a pathway that's covered with blood because there have been many people who have given up their lives going down this pathway for the cause of glorifying Christ. It's a pathway covered with tears because there's been a lot of pain as people have gone down this pathway. It's a pathway of a lot of happiness because there's times of joy when we go down the pathway of Christ. It's a pathway filled with companions other believers who are with you, behind you, in front of you, next to you, walking down this same pathway. But there is also a devil who will be on that pathway from time to time, and he will do all he can to take you off the path. He will do all he can to knowing that at the end, if you are truly God's child, you will make it to your final destination, but he wants to rob you of all the joy that is yours going down that pathway. You need to know that you have been granted great promises on this pathway. So if we're going to walk in the will of God, we need to know the provisions, we need to know the pathway, and we need to know the purpose.